It's called the CESA Act and it targets backers of a strong man. US sanctions came into effect Wednesday against the Assad regime in Syria. Will it deny the government of a political victory after years of conflict? And how will regime allies react to new sanctions? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. The war in Syria has devastated much of the country and its people. But President Bashar al-Assad has remained in power with the help of foreign allies. Well, there's now another threat facing tens of millions of Syrians, though. The economy has been decimated. It's now a third of what it was. Its currency is in freefall. And add to that a shortage of basic goods and rising prices. But Assad might not be able to count on his friends anymore to rebuild his state. New U.S. sanctions are now taking effect to punish anyone who does business with his country. It targets politicians, institutions, businesses and those engaged in transactions with the Syrian government. They could be banned from travel, denied access to U.S. markets or even face arrest. It could also affect partners like Russia and Iran, but also those in the Gulf and Europe too. American officials insist the sanctions will not harm Syrian civilians. The US Congress passed the so-called CESA Act that sanctions Syria last December. It's named after a pseudonym used by a Syrian defector who leaked more than 50,000 photos and videos documenting torture by government forces. The U.S. says the sanctions will put political and economic pressure on President Assad to halt human rights abuses and support a transitional government. And they go further than existing measures in targeting the government's backers outside Syria, including businesses, banking and oil and gas entities. Assad's main backers in the war are Russia and Iran. The law is seen as also targeting Tehran and Lebanon-based Hezbollah. The conflict has pushed nearly 80% of the population into poverty. The UN says Syrians are now facing even more hardship. The economic crisis is hitting every part of Syria, regardless of territorial control from Damascus and the southwest to Aleppo and the northwest and to the northeast. Medicine is more expensive and scarce. Food prices have skyrocketed and the supply chains have been disrupted. The purchasing power of ordinary Syrians has seriously diminished as wages, both private and public sector, are vastly inadequate to meet the demands of the day. The economic crisis has led to anti-government protests in Assad's strongholds of Latakia and Sueda. The president sacked his prime minister after he criticized the government's handling of the situation. But Syrians fear the sanctions could limit their access to basic goods. The Syrians have been suffering from a power shortage for many years because of the destruction of the infrastructure during the war. But now the question is, will the electricity situation change or become worse than it is now? We are afraid for the medical devices that we have. They are mostly imported from abroad. We do not manufacture medical devices locally, especially electronic devices. Unfortunately, every device that goes out of service due to maintenance or a malfunction is taking a lot of time to be repaired. We are losing a lot of parts during this crisis. And now we are more concerned for the future of these devices in particular. Let's bring our guests into the show now. We have joining us from Norman, Oklahoma, Joshua Landis, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. In Istanbul, Dr. Mar Kaf, executive director of the Omran Center for Strategic Studies. And in Moscow, Alexei Khlebnikov, Middle East expert at the Russian International Affairs Council. Thank you all for joining us. If I could start with Joshua. So just to make everything clear, now anyone engaging in virtually any sort of transaction with the Syrian government or an entity it controls will fall under these sanctions, right? Uh, yes, that's going to be particularly designed to hurt the Lebanese. Lebanon's only trading partner 
uh, next door to it is Syria. It has been the banking system, the lungs for the Syrian economy. This is going to send a message to all Lebanese, don't trade with Syria. And it's having a terrible effect on the why, Lebanese why, economy. Why would it be, as you said, designed to target Lebanon? Um, is this a message to Hezbollah in particular? Well, I'm sure that people in Washington hope it's going to bring down Hezbollah and turn Lebanon into an American partner um, that has democratic elections. The chances of this happening are very slight. Hezbollah is much better positioned to win this struggle uh, in a collapsing economy. It's the Christians and the wealthy Sunnis who are likely to leave the country and abandon it to Hezbollah, which is a tough and, um, and wiry competitor. Okay, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, do you share that perspective? Will, how, how will this impact the Syrian economy? I mean, the Syrian economy has been suffering for a long time now uh, as a result of the systematic uh, actions of the regime itself. Uh, the regime has mismanaged its uh, finances and its revenues and has spent more on the war, on killing people, on pushing people out of the country. And that is the root cause. Uh, I mean, the whole symbolic uh, name of Caesar was uh, the, the rights of those who have been disappeared, the rights of those who have been uh, uh, oppressed economically, socially, politically, in all levels. Uh, and so uh, one of the causes has been uh, the, the Lebanese uh, financial crisis has caused uh, the meltdown of the uh, Syrian pound. Uh, that is a, a, a true statement in a lot of uh, essence, but that, I mean, that, that is the fault of uh, uh, the, the Lebanese, uh, Hezbollah specifically. Uh, I don't think that this... But Dr. Omar, uh, do you agree with Joshua's analysis that it might ironically end up emboldening or empowering the very segment uh, that the U.S. is trying to weaken, at least, uh, at least as it applies to Lebanon when it comes to Hezbollah? I mean, this, this, let's not over-exaggerate the essence and the purpose of this law. This law, this act, uh, is, is directed at all the international backers of the regime and those who like to invest in the, in the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And it's telling them a message that you're not allowed to uh, go back and normalize relations and continue supporting the regime. Right. Uh, I, I don't think that this will uh, embolden or strengthen uh, Hezbollah more than it, it is. In fact, it'll make their life much diff much more difficult. It'll make the life of those who, who even tolerate Hezbollah uh, a much, much more uh, difficult, or even the Russians in that sense, uh, or other countries in the Gulf or other backers or uh, investors that like to, to invest. It will make people's lives, uh, those investors at least, okay. uh, much more I, difficult. I can see Alexei was shaking his head. I, I take it in disagreement there. So let me give uh, Alexei from Moscow a chance to weigh in on this. Is it going to make life more difficult for countries like Russia, the backers of uh, the Assad regime? Actually, I was nodding, uh, meaning that I agree with both uh, of my colleagues. Okay. And, uh, we can, we can the... still give you a chance to <laughs> nod in agreement as well as in disagreement. <laughs> Yeah, well, because I think uh, both of my colleagues right, and uh, in general, the the uh, um, the act uh, primarily uh, designed to weaken the, or at least to change the uh, regime's behavior, which I personally uh, don't agree with. But it's it, it more uh, it, it, its main target is to send a signal to uh, Damascus backers, primarily it's uh, Russia and Iran, and of course Hezbollah, that life will become um, harder for them. And also, uh, as uh, recently James Jeffrey will it be an effective message? That, do you think, Alexei? Uh, he, he won't. Uh, sorry. Will it be an effective message? You said it's designed to send that message. Will it well, be impactful? Well, definitely. Uh, well, definitely it will um, make uh, Syria a heavier burden to carry for Russia and Iran. Mm. That's, that's for sure, given especially the uh, very limited economic financial sources both countries have. And, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's definitely an, an impactful message. But I don't think we should expect neither Moscow nor Tehran to uh, change overnight their mind or to change their policies towards uh, Syria. Okay, I want to bring Joshua back into the discussion and ask the question of the timing. 
Why now? I mean, this war has been going on for a very long time. The allegations of abuse, of torture, of internment, uh, of indiscriminate bombing, all of these things have been well documented for a very long time. Why are we only now seeing the Caesar Act coming into effect? Well, it's had to percolate through all of these different systems. You know, I, I think, look, at these, these acts are designed to punish uh, those three actors, you know, the, the Syrian regime, the Russians, the Iranians, and of course, Hezbollah. The, the point, though, I think, is that, you know, this is a retribution for these um, leaders who have won the war in Syria. The problem is, is that they're least likely to be the ones that are hurt the most. They will be hurt. Of course, they'll be hurt. Everybody's going to be hurt in this. But it's the weak. It's the feeble. It's the hungry. It's all the children who are malnourished that are going to really be crushed by this. And, and we know what, what terrible effects malnourishment has on mental and physical developments in children. This is devastating. And it's, um, it's a, you know, a burnt earth retaliation for Assad's and Iran's and Russia's success. And it will make life miserable for them. You know, the, the, the US uh, special envoy, Jeffrey, said, my job is to make Syria a quagmire for Russia and Iran and Hezbollah. And that's what this is really designed to do. It's gonna turn it into a quagmire. But as the rats eat each other, you know, as you the, 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 the people get hungrier, it's gonna be the strong who get the food. The weak All right. who don't. All right. And that's, that, that seems very obvious. You've made a very clear point. And I think, Dr. Amar, if I can read how you're shaking your head, I think you're definitely in disagreement with that. So let me, let me give you a chance, Dr. Amar. I mean, I, again, the, the sole perpetrator of hunger, of, uh, of destruction, has been the government of Syria. That let's not lose focus of the, the true criminal on, on, on this planet. Uh, and not the the reactions of the of the international community. Now, obviously, Caesar Act is not going to change overnight anybody's uh, uh, behavior. It will not change the regime, and it, it may not necessarily, at least alone, change the behavior of this regime. But it will make it, it will make its life much more miserable, and it will uh, cause international actors to think twice before uh, making any uh, contracts or engagements or reconstruction or normalizing with uh, one of the most criminal regimes uh, in, in modern history. And so the, the real focus is that where is the cause of hunger? And, and, and I mean, we all know the humanitarian aspect is exempt from this law. So let's not directly say that it will definitely cause hunger. Now, it, it will cause uh, obviously some negative repercussions on uh, average individuals and average uh, communities in, across Syria whether in northeast, northwest, and, and we know that the population of Syria has been depopulated uh, mostly. And so uh, this is where the humanitarian and, and the U.S. has increased, and, and Europe, uh, a lot of its aid in, during the last year and even the last few months uh, to support those who are hungry, okay. and even in regime areas. And so uh, this, this doesn't mean that we abandon. I mean, obviously, if you do this without the humanitarian element to, to, to cover, uh, it'll be problematic. But uh, again, also think about if you don't do this, who's going to be emboldened? It's the regime and its backers at the same time. So it's like you do it, you're doomed, and you don't do it, and, and, and you get the same result. So whether you enact this or you don't enact it, uh, the regime will always find its way and its backers to, to circumvent right. it and to, to go around it. All right. You mentioned one aspect there of uh, potentially countries cancelling contracts. Alexei in Moscow, what's the likelihood, of course, Russia, Iran, they have a history of, of facing U.S. sanctions. What's the likelihood that they're going to now cancel, perhaps, contracts, um, get out of, perhaps, deals uh, related to either rebuilding Syria or investing in its oil and gas industry? Well, I don't think that's going to happen, um, neither in the short term nor in the mid or long term. Don't forget that Russia, if we talk about Russia, it's in Syria for at least 49 years. This is the, the agreement which was signed between Russia and Syrian government for the lease of the um, military bases in uh, Mimim and Tartus. So um, that means that Russia will uh, carry that burden no matter uh, how hard it, how heavy it is. Um, so I don't expect that change to happen either from Russian nor from Iranian side. 
I also wanted to get back to what uh, Omar uh, mentioned about the humanitarian aid. Already uh, before the Caesar Act, uh, existing U.S. sanctions and EU sanctions, uh, even the EU officials already acknowledged that those sanctions, they significantly obstruct the delivery of humanitarian aid to Syria. That is no question about that. And after the inaction, uh, enactment of the Caesar Act, that will uh, make it even even harder. And actually, the enactment of the Caesar Act, it actually makes EU sanctions meaningless because uh, the, the Caesar Act encompasses everything, basically. So that's a very um, um, tricky story. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amar, I'll give you a chance to come back in very briefly because I, I can see you want to have a rebuttal on that very briefly in, in 30 seconds. I mean, the, uh, yes, the Russians won't cancel any contracts, but uh, the Russians are going to continue to seek dialogue with the United States. And that's what the U.S. has been trying to do and, and the Russians. And I think that's a mutual interest, a further dialogue between both countries, mm -hmm. uh, not just on Syria, but on many files. And I think that's one of the perhaps indirect uh, objectives of uh, the Caesar Act. Okay, and that's an important point. I'll pick up on it in a second, but if we can perhaps just finish this thought on the economics of the whole situation. Joshua, the Syrian pound reached a record low to the US dollar on June the 8th. Is what's happening demonstrating that the Syrian government can really no longer manage the economy and even its backers like Iran and Syria can't really save it this time? Um, you're right. You know, what they both need, this is really, the Syrian pound has inflated in tandem with the Lebanese pound, and it stems from the Lebanese banking crisis in which they froze all dollar accounts. And much of Syria's economy, businessmen, and probably, you know, even elements of the government have kept accounts in Lebanon. All those were froze. The money is gone. The Lebanese have mismanaged and, and uh, run a big Ponzi scheme. And so there are no dollars to try to shore up the currency. And the government is, is scrambling now. And obviously, it's counting on Russia and Iran to, to step in and try to shore up the currency. But in the meantime, we're in a hyperinflation situation with COVID, with the war, with uh, the banking crisis. All of this is compounded. And the United States, I think, has you know, obviously timed this very well in order to kick the last props from underneath the Syrian people in order to, to tumble the country into a state of starvation, hoping that this will uh, force Assad into some kind of political concessions. And that's the idea. You know, the, the stated goal of the United States is not to turn this into a quagmire, it's to beget some kind of democratic outcome overseen by the UN. But I can't see that after nine years of war with Assad winning, that he's going to all of a sudden decide he's going to leave office and allow the opposition to come in and have a political process that has defied the United States for 50 years in Syria. It's just not going to work, uh, but it will help starve a lot of people. And, and so I see this as a very negative thing. But, it's good uh, to, for to Dr. Amar's point, Joshua, if I may, uh, how, how do you respond, though, to this perspective that says, look, the, the Syrian people in any case are suffering. That's the whole reason why this pseudonym, Mr. Caesar, had to bring 50,000 photos and videos. You can't leave people suffering um, under a regime like that anyway. Well, but they are. How... They're leaving it suffering. This is not going to bring regime change. I don't think anybody thinks. Even, right. you know, even the promoters of this don't think it's going to have a real effect on Assad's behavior or the regime. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like asking a few hungry people to overturn a big military regime. They're not going to do it. Uh, they can demonstrate, but they can't overturn the regime. And that's the problem. This is going to starve okay. the people. It's not going to cause regime change. Let me th Perhaps the thought might go to, if the people can't change the regime, maybe the backers of the regime can change the regime. Uh, Alexei in Moscow, you said a moment ago, of course, you explained how much Ru Russia is too heavily invested over the last nine years in Syria with the base and so on and so forth. Well... Is it possible they might not want to pull out of Syria? Is it possible they might decide that the Bashar al-Assad regime is too costly and might try and put their influence into regime change in Syria? Well, I think there is always a risk of, uh, you know, rising costs of your um, uh, involvement there. But 
so far, I don't think that uh, the cost of Russian involvement is um, um, is is very heavy for for Moscow. So I think that the involvement will continue. And actually, um, let's not forget that um, Moscow clearly understands that uh, Damascus and uh, Assad themselves are not the. I mean, uh, he's not the uh, easiest partner to deal with. And uh, I mean, uh, if you recall Russia's uh, relations with its allies, like for example, Belarus and Armenia, there are also uh, tons of differences and frictions between them. So you cannot expect uh, relations between partners be being always smooth. So um, this is why that uh, there are natural disagreements, natural frictions. But in general, I don't think Moscow will be ready to abandon what it has been investing in for the last uh, nine years, and especially over the last five years. And uh, one of its main goals is to showcase, to demonstrate uh, but is it possible, story. Alexei, but, but is it possible that in order not to abandon what it, it has invested in, it might decide the best thing is to get rid of this regime and have some kind of transition, some political transition? Well, uh, I wouldn't go that far saying that the regime equals I mean, if we talk about the regime change, we're talking about the political institutions. We are talking about the, uh, the state structures. Russia is not ready to change that. What Russia might consider is changing of the uh, leadership. I mean, Moscow being consistent with saying that uh, it's not backing Assad as a person, uh, Assad as a leader, but uh, in, in his embodiment, it backs the uh, the Syrian state, the Syrian institutions, from uh, to prevent them from collapse, to oppose what happened in uh, in Iraq or in Libya, which threw those countries in uncontrolled chaos. Okay, let's bring Dr. Marin. How do you see the possibility of perhaps political transition being instigated by the Caesar Sanctions Act? I mean, I, I mentioned that the Caesar Act will not create miracles. It will not. Uh, Overflow the overthrow the regime or cause by itself at least. Uh, it is one of the tools for accountability. It is one of the tools that uh, the U.S. is using to uh, to create uh, rifts, to create uh, gaps between partners of the regime, uh, and then therefore creating more opportunities for dialogue and negotiations. Um, and, and so, I, I, I mean, the, in terms of the hunger, the hunger is already going uh, and, and it's increasing in Syria as a result of the systematic policies of the central government. And so uh, let's, let's not over-exaggerate that this uh, act is going to create the miracles, but also let's not also underestimate its power uh, in uh, creating new alliances, in creating new uh, avenues for discussions uh, and, and negotiations. All right. I think we've got about... 60 seconds left. Let me give it to Joshua and say, looking at things from a domestic US political perspective, we're about, what, five months away from elections? How important is it, containment of Iran and, and Russia domestically to the US political calculations? You know, President uh, Trump is very transactional and he's working with various interest groups in the United States who have a big interest in, um, in, in Syria. And you know, those we know are Gulf and Israel. And so this, this is what it's about for the domestic. It's about winning the elections for President Trump and uh, allowing certain interest groups to have their way in foreign policy. And, uh, and that's, you know, I think it comes down to something very simple about uh, the powers domestically, because Americans don't care about Syria. They, you know, if the Syrians starve, it, it doesn't make any difference to them, or if Assad survives or doesn't survive, it's really a very little material well, interest to the average American who don't even know where Syria is. But it is important for the political, um, you know, for the, the election process. Sad for the, the Syrian people who so, seem to be constantly on the, you know, the suffering end of this. Let's thank our guests very much for all of their contributions to this show, Joshua, Dr. Ammar and Alexi. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story.
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye. Thank you.